Good morning, Misfits. You are tuning into another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Three quarters of the Goon Squad is in the house. Sherby Sherb is uh, hunting for tadpoles again. Um, we'll we'll see him next week. Is that a euphemism? On today's yes. I won't tell you what it means though. Uh, on today's episode, we're going to be kicking it old school. Something that we've done in different forms of content in the past, but essentially case study type of thing where Hunter and I will tackle looking at some videos and questions from athletes and what we would do in a remote coaching setting and then how you could think about changing some of your training or the way that you approach training to tackle it on your own. Before we get to that, make sure you head to our Instagram page and click on the link in bio uh, so you can sign up for training camp. We have a training camp just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in October at CrossFit Raid. Officially, officially, Saturday, October 12th through the 13th, but it's actually Friday, uh, the 11th through the 13th, because we'll do a little meet and greet and maybe something fun on Friday night to, to serve as an icebreaker. So make sure you go there and get signed up. Um, if you are going to the CrossFit Games in Texas, you can look for myself, Jen, Ted, Gabe, come see us, say what up. Um, and if you are I going might be to busy, be, but you can wave, yeah, you can wave. <laughs> um, and if you are going to the Masters CrossFit Games in Balmy, Birmingham, Alabama, at the end of the month, uh, you can add Hunter to that list. Hunter will also be with us yeah. at the That's Masters. That's definitely going to bring games. the followers out. That's the, <laughs> yes. that'll be the difference maker for everybody. The ticket for sales sure. just went through the fucking <laughs> roof, bro. He's a Kenzie is very excited about the crew. She's like, I may just not compete and just hang out. She's so. going to compete. <laughs> <laughs> Believe you me. She's uh, going to compete. She's also going to hang out, Drew. You can't stop her. Yeah, true. That's true. <laughs> she's not allowed to hang out. Um, <laughs> she's, there's no way she's listening to this She's going to hang out on the, on the turf. <laughs> true. All right. Um, before we get to all of the case study stuff and live chat, make sure you are ready to head to MisfitAthletics.com Monday, August 5th for Phase 0. We spend five weeks before phase one doing baseline testing to set you up for the year. This is extremely important if you want to follow along in our off-season program of phase one, phase two, and phase three. That is games athletes, semifinals athlete, quarterfinals athletes, and open athletes. Top to bottom, make sure you get signed up for phase zero. Um, there's a lot of information that you collect during that period of time that can help you make a lot of decisions. And if you're curious about it, we are going to be doing an episode very soon on what phase zero is and how to tackle it. Um, affiliate programming phase one begins Monday, August 19th. If you are an affiliate owner, make sure you head to the Sugarwad marketplace or teammisfit.com to get signed up. Um, we have an affiliate coaches and owners discord channel um, that will come along with getting signed up for that. You can talk with us about how you're running your classes and coaching and answer all kinds of questions. Um, and we'll also be doing a podcast related to affiliate phase one. So keep your eye out for that. Properfuel.co, use the code word misfit, sharpen the axe code.com. Use the code word page. You save 10% on your order. 10% goes to page towards her 2024 CrossFit games journey. Gentlemen, live chat. What's up? What's up? I, uh, I'm a little bit concerned with how obsessed i'm kind of becoming with barbecued meat yeah, this is meat. an evolution of life my friend it really is <laughs> and not only am i like doing it more often but i'm also watching content i started watching the barbecue showdown on netflix the other day and mm -hmm. it's one it's a pretty great show and two some of the meat that they're cranking out is a real serious. which one is that because like the amount of showdown shows <laughs> yeah, now i need yeah, you to yeah. be very specific yeah so they're at like some ranch and they've got like a huge barn that's full of like state-of-the-art kitchens they've got like seven or eight different kitchens and then they've got seven or eight different smoke spots and it's like a competition okay. yeah uh with is a it couple food of network 
No, it's Netflix original, I think. Oh, yeah. oh I know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Yes. There's some yeah. lady that w has won the world championship of barbecue seven times and her co-host is some big famous dude, but it's pretty impressive what they do with a, uh, with a brisket. It's pretty, uh, pretty inspiring. What's I've your got next my... thing you're going to tackle? Crazy what I know those you've been kids into the brisket <laughs> nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, brisket is definitely my next, my next yeah. summit that I want to try to try to reach yeah. the peak of. Uh, tonight though, I'm going to do a couple of pork loins, smoked pork loins. I know pork loins are a little bit leaner, but apparently they smoke pretty good. So we'll, we'll have to find out. If I, can I think eat pork juicy. is the king of taking on the smoke flavor. I think that combo is like any form of, of pork product, rib, yeah. even tenderloin, anything like that. Yeah. It's yeah. Great. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I feel like you'll be able to keep that bad boy pretty moist with a low, slow sort of vibe. I hope so. I was considering injecting it, but I don't know if I'll go. I've, I've dry brined it overnight. But I mean, we've, really I've done the like <laughs> super simple, like tenderloin and just straight in the oven, like yeah. nothing special at all. And it stays pretty moist if you just pull it at the right temp and let it resting pork is yeah. the key. Yeah, for sure. Like pull it at 140 or something like that. Yeah. Something even probably might even a little bit earlier if, if you let it sit long enough. Gordon Ramsay says pork has to sit for as long as it cooks. But yeah. I'm assuming there's a <laughs> That'd be tough small, small <laughs> exemption when you smoke it for yeah. X number of hours. But I'm going to pull it at 100 and see what happens. The yeah, meter thermometer fine. does a really good job of that. If you input the right stuff, it'll tell you yeah. when to pull it. Mm -hmm. And then you leave it and then you leave it in there. So like you get more alerts as it's resting. All right, I'll have to look into those. Do you have a meter, Ted? Do you have a meter? I really? Don't. Really, oh, really. That's surprising. I've got a pretty sweet, I don't know, thermometer set up, but it's not a meter. It's got yeah. cords and all that. Yeah, the Bluetooth and the notifications are, are clutch. Walk away. If you're like you me, Bluetooth? though, it's never charged, so when you go to use it, you can't. So, uh, Perfect. I'm not like you. Most of my electronics are usually <laughs> charged to just. <laughs> well, that one's weird because like it seems like if you basically you get this little wooden block that is a magnet on your yeah. fridge and you have batteries in it. And if you leave it on there long enough without using it, the batteries get drained. And uh, it, so like yeah, there's it, no way would, to like you would think it was charged. <laughs> Got it. So it's not like yeah. a plug it in type of thing. No, what no, I'd be able to handle that. But <laughs> fucking batteries. Old yeah, that's shit. A you got hunty um yeah the uh the golf golf journey continues i was telling you guys earlier we had a we hosted a competition on saturday um and i consumed probably like 426 calories all day and far fewer ounces of water I definitely had more coffee than i had water and instead of opting water for and coffee right there yes that is true um <laughs> And so I, uh, instead of opting to play after the competition from which I was just fucking wiped from running, I hit a bucket of balls. The single worst bucket of balls I think I've maybe ever hit, including from when I started golfing, um, which was terrifying because the next morning I was playing in like, uh, we had a bunch of the members at the local club get together. And I was like, I was, well, it was funny. One of the guys texted the group saying, like, let's have some fun. Who's going to sleep for eight hours and like be all ready to go, but then shoot a hundred and who's going to come over, who's going to come here hung over on three hours of sleep and fucking shoot 70. And I was like, God damn it. Like I just hit the worst bucket of balls I've ever hit. And somebody just willed a score of 100 into existence because <laughs> I'm definitely going to get eight hours of sleep and get ready. Uh, and then I, I did much better than expected. So a third uh a third sub 80 on the season is is helping the old handicap out yeah what is your like biggest improvement this year what part of your game um well i spent all winter working on the swing so the swing consistency i've developed a fairly a much more repeatable swing than i refer is that mostly irons mostly on my irons i've gotten and i've gotten a lot better off the tee um, yeah. everybody always makes the fun comment of drive for show and putt for dough. And that is accurate if the first ball you hit off the tee gets in play. But if you can't hit the ball off the tee, if you're constantly either in the woods or just out of bounds, 
it doesn't fucking matter how good your putting is because you're already seven strokes deep by the time you get on the green. So being able to put a ball in play and drive, you know, on a on a good day, put it put it 300 yards down the fairway is a uh, and reliably fairly straight has become a a big game changer. Not all have, the time. Do you have any but, like pre-play rituals that you do? You listen to like a hype up song, you watch any inspirational videos? No, but I do like I can't. I really like I've been nursing like a little bit of a hip injury just from presumably like just ass blasting a repeated range of motion that I'm not uh <laughs> that I'm not like all that trained in, just swinging a club in one direction. So, I kind of I just like it's a warm up. Like I warm up before I play golf. Okay. Um, which I think is more than many many golfers can say they do. Um, if you need any inspirational videos, I might have one for you. Okay. You I watch do it? tend to like your inspiration. <laughs> yes. Ted, Ted, yeah, it's definitely. usually yeah. motivating. <laughs> yep. Here you go. Hi, this is Todd Lawrence Davis. Here's some fun advice for you. I want you all to look to yourself. I want you to find, get out your phone, pull it up right now. I want you to pull it up after watching this video. Remember, I want you to think today of your life that you are a not a one through ten. You're not what's defined by people and that puts you in a box. You're not a ten. You're not a 50. Today, all of you are a hundred. Yeah. You're a hundred. You're a hundred, baby. Like yeah, have the moxie. About. Be the best version of you. You got to live to be the best hundred you can. And remember. <laughs> He's selling tea? Every <laughs> single day. Only at Silver Tower City. Really takes a left turn there at the end, I'm but uh, I want to... Hunter. I want to see Hunter headphones in before every tee box, <laughs> telling Just himself he's a hundred guy. Yeah, I'm a hundred. Yeah, yeah, I'm not a one through a ten. I'm a yeah, hundred. You're a hundred, baby. Keep it in mind. Uh, promptly Next time you hit hundred yards. <laughs> yeah. Drive. Yeah, so you're a hundred. All right. <laughs> I went to the. Yards. I went to the driving range twice before the misfit golf scramble, and yeah, you did, bro. That first swing. As a 38 year old man, that <laughs> twist uh, is wild. Yeah. Get some it popping. Is wild. Yeah, joints. I mean, you like, and the warm up's not crazy. Like, if I stood there for one minute and just twisted back and forth, I'd be fine. But not yeah. like I would not have. Cons- the, I last time I golfed, I was in my fucking mid 20s, and like I would not have considered that at all. You feel nothing in your mid 20s, and then you're 38, and you're like, oh my god, I think I almost just died. Yeah, like I'm like, what the fuck is happening when I <laughs> rotate here? Cause I'm so used to goddamn midline engaged, butt back, knees out, and golf's mm-hmm. like, no, do the yeah. opposite. You think that hurts? You should try putting on your socks some morning. <laughs> throw your back out pretty easily. Can't make me. Won't do it. <laughs> not wearing socks. It's dangerous. I'll golf and do CrossFit. But will not put on socks. I'm going to even the scales. My life chat will just be about football almost exclusively. Um, sure. Told me that when I need to go watch. Start. It's close. Okay. September. Yeah, usually oh, like September. the first week of September. But um, I, any content for me, like I, I don't need. I need anything you want to give me related to. I can't watch preseason football. Um, but I can listen to people talk about football. I can watch old football highlights, that kind of thing. Training camp stuff is great. Um. But Sherb told me to go watch the basically this year's um, the Peyton Manning did the uh, quarterback show last year on Netflix. And there's receivers this year, um, and I was on vacation when he sent it to me, and I watched the trailer. And the trailer is just like two teams talking shit at the 50 yard line before a game, and, like headbutting each other. And I was shadow boxing, just <laughs> so fucking ready to go. And um, I was listening to an interview with Mike Vrabel, and he was talking about when. Belichick finally got Rodney Harrison onto the Patriots and the very first practice that they had with pads with Harrison there. Um, I don't want to go too far into the weeds, but Patriots fans, at least or football fans from back then can remember like Kevin Falk on like an option route, like those short little passes happened all the fucking time. And especially Vrabel said it was either him or Brewski were trying to cover him did not go well. Falk caught the ball, and in front of 8,000 training camp fans, Rodney Harrison blew his shit up, like, at <laughs> practice. Like, very first thing. And 
Said it wasn't a dirty hit, but Kevin spiked the ball, pissed because his teammate fucking decked him, and Harrison screamed, fuck you at him. <laughs> and one of the defensive mark, coaches you know? came over and was like, you got to take care of your teammates. What are you doing? And Harrison goes, fuck you too. <laughs> and Vrabel nice. and Brewski were like, oh, we got a dog. We got a dog on our team. Yeah, he was definitely a and, wild card for sure. Oh, my God. He was so good, though. Oh, yeah. He was so dynamic back there. Old school safeties, like looking back on it probably ruined like hundreds of lives in terms of traumatic brain injuries but we didn't know any better back then and it was awesome to watch unless they let a fullback get to the secondary then they're the ones on the receiving end of that Mm -hmm. trust how early do you play (laughs) uh fantasy like how when do your drafts start um honestly i'm the league's commissioner and i'm the reason why it gets pushed so close to the season because that's (laughs) normally like CrossFit games, yeah. like traveling for my wedding anniversary, like all that shit is so, and they already, all the guys that I play with are in like seven leagues. So they're like, can't do this date, can't do this date, can't do this date, can't do this date. Also, when you spend all of your budget on a player and then they get hurt in one of the final weeks of preseason, that's kind of brutal. Yeah. So doing it like legitimately within seven days of that first game is the right, I, th- I think the right play. When I so, was down in North Carolina <clears throat> with Kenzie and Roy, Roy was yeah. actively drafting, and it was like two weeks ago. Was he doing like a like a DraftKings thing? No, or was he legitimately like drafting? He's a got la- a league that he's in. Yeah, it's a league that he's in. I think he runs it, and he said that they do a twenty four hour window per draft pick over the course of like three weeks or something like that where they've got 24 hours to pick and trade within like that one pick. But he said they started like June 18th or something like that. I was like, what the fuck happens if the lineups change or like somebody gets traded or injured? (laughs) He's like, that's bad luck. People are still requesting trades right now. Training, training camp injuries, obviously. Right. Yeah. Achilles and ACLs and all that. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. So, uh, yeah. Football season is close. So I'm real, ex- real excited about it. All right, Hunter, let's get to the show. Too. Let's get to the show. Thrilled. So I received a message um, on Discord from an athlete that went a little something like this. My one rep max on things like back squat, strict press, et cetera, tend not to be too much higher than my three rep max or my five rep max. For example, I retested my one rep max back squat last week. This week, I got the five rep max at 94% of my one rep max. I know the one rep max isn't the most important thing, but I'd like to have accurate benchmarks when we do percentage work. Any tips on why there isn't much difference in my one rep max? We all, there's, there's an answer to this question in general that Hunter and I could pontificate on, and, and I think we're going to do that after we look at the video and talk about this athlete's particular issues. But that's going to be the first question that we have. We're in a remote coaching situation, and the application comes through, and it's like, that this is my one rep max, and then we're doing Texas method with them, and it's the same number for their five rep. We'd be like, uh, excuse me, can we take a look at this? Um, so if you're watching on YouTube, um, or if you're listening, probably go watch this on YouTube. It'd be a lot more helpful. We'll do our best to sort of describe what's going on here. But I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to take a look at these videos real quick. Technology. <clears throat> And he sent us both a one rep max and a five rep max for correct. So we are going to look at the one rep max right now. He's unracking the bar. Hmm. All right. There we have our one rep max. Hunter, any thoughts on this one rep max? Um, so as it relates to the question specifically, there there are a couple of like minor, I would say pretty minor. Overall, it's a pretty decent squat, I'd say. There are a few movement faults, a few things that we could cue and maybe um, help him out with from a movement perspective. But the first thing that stood out to me when I watched it is that's not a one rep max. Um, sure. And that might be the reason that they're close because based on when we... When we get to the five rep max video, when we see that final rep, it's like, motherfucker, that's what your one rep max should have looked like. 
Um, sure. The way that he stood this up just to me indicates that like I think he's got more in the tank and may and also don't have the context for hey I added five pounds and I got buried by it because that could that could be the case but based on what we saw out of his five rep max I'd be surprised and just the way that he stood this rep up makes me wonder if that is in fact his one rep max. Truth. Um, Any thoughts on technique? Yeah. So the 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 biggest thing is he actually and can you go back to the start. Um, start of the, and uh, yeah, just like the start of the squat. Actually, actually, we'll touch on the the unracking because we can we can go super deep into this. Um, one of the most kind of overlooked elements is what an athlete does before they even unrack the bar. Um, when you get underneath the bar prior to unracking, so you've got your hands, you know, in the right spot. You step underneath the bar, but you haven't stood the the bar up. You have to brace prior to unracking that bar. You watch old K Star videos, Kelly Starrett. We want one of the biggest things that we talk about is the fact that you can't gain tension from a loaded or you know from a from a loaded position. So if you go to unrack that bar, you step back and then you decide to brace. You've you've mi- you've kind of missed the boat. You missed the bus stop. We need to brace before we unrack the weight. We do that by squeezing the butt, bracing the midline, and then on rack. So you have now kind of preset your body to receive the weight that gets on your shoulders. And then maybe there's a brief rebracing that occurs, um, you know, before you initiate that squat. When he starts squatting, it starts off pretty decent, I would say. As he gets towards that parallel point, you can start to see the knees start to shift forward. Um, and it might appear minor, but it's very easy to tell that the weight is really far forward in his feet. Even though he's maintaining a fairly upright position, I can tell how much of that weight is forward on his toes, um, which means his quads relative to his hamstrings and glutes are doing so much more of the work. And that's just going to that that has to limit how much you can lift because those muscles aren't as strong. Because those quads are doing a lot of the work, our glutes aren't, our hamstrings aren't, our midline is not transferring that energy as quite as efficiently, and, and you're just going to get capped at the weight that you can lift just because you're not using the muscles that are optimal for you know, the heaviest lift we can in a squat. So those are kind of the big, the big things that I, I noticed fairly quick on just that one single rep. And we can, um, for, for everybody listening, I'm, I'm going to go back to the bottom here, but we can definitely s- slide a pack of matches under his heel right there. But yeah. Hunter's referencing being able to, to, to look at this from that perspective of where is the weight loaded. Um, just from a physics standpoint, if my surface area, let's say I had feet that were like four inches long, it'd be really Peg-like. hard to see. <laughs> What's that? I mean, pe- like I tell athletes this, like, hey, would you rather squat like on peg legs or with your oh sure a, yeah your human feet, you know? And yeah. sorry. So yeah. so as and and it's really important too. It's not just that his weight is in the front half of his foot there, and that we're talking about having more surface area. That surface area that isn't connected to anything. So now we have a balance issue. His you yeah. know we're, our our ankles don't come out of the front half of our foot. So when he goes to bounce there. I'm wondering if he's doing a one rep max at any point, like how much of that is dependent on accuracy? Like, and it's a weird thing to think about when you're talking about one of the simplest movements in the sport. Um, But when you go to bounce and you're wondering whether you're going to basically fall forward if you try to stand the weight up, that's obviously going to be an issue there. Um, The way that I like to work with athletes on this problem is finding the deviation and and seeing if we can and make sure that it doesn't happen in that way. So what I mean by that is he's going down here, everything starts to look good. And then about here, we see a pretty sharp move forward. Like Hunter said, that knee comes out. I wouldn't mind this bottom position from someone who does Olympic lifting if his heels were on the ground. What I don't yeah. want to see is an athlete sit straight down and then when they go to bounce, shoot their knees forward. Um, not great movement practice, and it's also a recipe for patellar tendonitis over the course of going through certain, you know, you're doing the five by five and the five rep max squat as we are right now on the site. Like that's going to be a huge problem there. So 
I see a, an accuracy issue. Um, I'm uh, wondering I, what would happen if his feet were a little bit wider. That's a kind of a tough position to be in there. You know, you love to see the upright torso and the knees tracking outside of the feet. Like a lot of this is good, but I'm wondering if he's pushed forward because his squat stance is so narrow. And that gets into the weeds of like, I got to see you squat, do a squat hold wider. Do you know without, how tall he shoes is? On. Um, uh, honestly, Cause if he's, like, because if, if he's five six, it's like that's a five. He's not I would five say six. That's, yeah, no. so is yeah. I think yeah, he's I mean, probably in the five ten range. Would be my guess, something like that. So that's a pretty okay. narrow squat stance. But again, like, there's a lot of good in this bottom position. I joke all the time if I could pause athletes, especially in the Olympic lifts, and poke them in the chest, and they just sit a tiny bit back, then all the stuff that he's not using that Hunter reference is in play now. If his heels down and he tracks to that position without a large deviation, then he's going to be able to use his hamstrings and glutes. And I really just want someone squat over a long enough time horizon to get to the point where going down and going up looks like we're just re playing the video in reverse. I don't want to see him shoot forward like this. And I also don't want to see his ass shoot way back like a lot of athletes who go hamstring only. Yeah, the I, I mean, I think, th in my opinion, this is probably, like, of the things that in CrossFit we kind of look for from a functional movement perspective, being this being kind of posterior chain engagement, is probably the, like, the most common fault I see across almost all movements. And I think a lot of it has to do with, like, it's not really natural to kind of sit in such a way where you, especially when you're doing a squat, for example, that you engage your glutes and your hamstrings. Athletes want to stay upright with their chest a little bit more. And doing that while being able to engage your glutes and hamstrings takes practice. It takes work. It, it's like you have to learn how to do the movement correctly. And CrossFitters just naturally default to a much more quad dominant style of movement in general. Um, even even with movements that aren't supposed to be like a deadlift, it's why athletes are always complaining after a deadlift metcon. It's like my back hurts or it's, you know, it's wall, God forbid it's hinge and squat in the same workout, deadlift hinge. And a lot of it has to do with athletes not correctly recruiting their posterior chain to help with the movement. And they're like, with that comes the midline stability. And with that comes a much more stable kind of heels down squat and it's it's one of those things that just I, I see so often at the affiliate level but it also it's also at the high le highest level too this is not like a a lack of experience thing this is a lack of proper motor recruitment pattern thing yeah and i mean taking this all the way back to like 2010 2011 we're watching like why does this why is this person so good at wall balls it's like why all of these athletes are strong and skilled and they can squat and they can do X, Y, and Z. Why does Bobby love wall balls and Timmy hates wall balls? And then you watch them and you're like, that guy's feet are glued to the floor. Got the mm -hmm. surface area. We've got the quad, the adductors. We've got the glutes. We've got the hamstrings all involved, kind of passing it around. Um, also, just jumping around and being like unbalanced is takes a lot of energy, a lot of stabilizer muscles to use. Um, <clears throat> so that get, that like puts me in the mindset of like, does this look exactly the same every time? And does this look repeatable? And are we again, passing around what needs to be used? So we're going to look at the five rep max right now for context for people listening. Um, his one rep max is 315 and his five rep max is 300. It's a video that we just watched, um, was 315. This one will be 300 pounds. And I mean, even on that first rep, and you can tell me to stop talking if you want to watch the video, no. Drew, but even on no. that first rep, you can see, like, I'm not going to ask you to do the technology of side by side here, but like, you should be able to see the difference in that first rep, how far his knees go forward or how far they don't compared to how far they went forward in that one rep max. Like his knees right. were well forward of his toes in that one, this first rep of his five rep max clearly the knees go a little bit forward but he does a much better job of staying in his rooted in kind of the back half of his foot at least for that first rep 
but he's already so so true to here. But then watch what happens as he goes to stand up. That is so much quad. You see yep. him go down, still and I want this to reverse. Forward. I want yeah. him to look like this when he's squatting, and he's coming up, and that is so much and tension forward. on you trying so hard to like push back and grip the floor yep. instead of like I have these incredibly strong things on the back half of my leg. Let's see if I can use them. Rep two, good looking squat, but same thing. S yep. extremely quad dominant there and it's slowly going reverting back to that like now the knees are even further forward in the descent which means that's where they have to go yeah yep rep four is a little bit tougher and then this is what i was talking about with the accuracy thing so it is 94 percent or whatever he said but look at what happens when that weight gets because like if I'm looking at the end of the barbell here, a thing that you would do back in the old coach's eye, like bounce. Okay, does it go back up? And look how far forward that thing is going. Yeah, it's right? just moving. And he, and at every inch he ascends, he's further into his quads, and he's fur and he's trying even harder to recruit more quad to get out of the bottom. And that also that last rep, like aside, like let let's get rid of the mechanical faults. Like that's how hard a one rep max should look. So that's where right. I'm kind of saying, like, hey, I'm wondering if that one rep max is a legitimate one rep max or just about as heavy as he wanted to go for the day. So obviously the first thing that we addressed here, which is so important, is the movement itself. Not what's he got for power output. Do we look at his other numbers and see, is he just like a muscle endurance guy versus a power output guy? What can we do here? What can we do to his energy systems? What accessory work can we do? Um, we'll get into that. We've got to start with the movement, not only because we always do that, but we're talking about the fucking squat right now. Like we're yeah, talking only about the back squat, front squat, overhead squat, squat clean, movements. squat snatch, wall balls. I don't need to keep going, but those things pop up in our sport over and over and over. So like, yeah, he, he wants his one rep max to go up. But again, what happens in a high rep wall ball workout? Um, and you know, one thing that could be interesting is is putting him through a decent amount of squats without those lifting shoes because it looks like he has great ankle flexion. Like, I don't think yeah. there are any issues there. Um, I love lifting shoes for one rep max situations because there are the neural adaptations that we talk about all the time where the more weight that you are standing up, even if you have those weightlifting shoes on, the bigger short-term adaptation that we can make. But long-term adaptations are the ones where we're going to be able to take his five rep max to a place where he can then actually do, you know, put the effort and technique into the one rep max. Yeah, my my only, my thoughts on weightlifting shoes, like, I, me personally, like, if you don't need them, I don't like using them. I understand there's the utility in, like, the specific instance in which we might want to use them for like a one rep max or maybe an Olympic lift, or they have a good application for somebody who doesn't have great ankle range of motion. But if you have the requisite mobility, um, I also think they're, they are probably contributing to him being so quad dominant because ultimately that's the purpose of them, right? It's to, it's to artificially create ankle dorsiflexion so that an Olympic weightlifter can be super super upright when they receive a clean or when they receive a snatch right it's a it's kind of a specific piece of equipment for a specific use that doesn't necessarily isn't always necessary in crossfit so i agree like maybe maybe we're squatting without weightlifting shoes for a phase and i think that would also help root him a little bit further kind of in the back half of his foot and maybe get some posterior chain engagement via wardrobe change Yep. Uh, I definitely agree with that. Um, you're going to be so surprised that I think that he should spend a significant amount of time doing barefoot squat holds. I think he needs to feel that position what? and know what that is actually like. I think warming up with things like glute ham raises and RDLs and banded walks and clamshells and all of these things that light up the musculature that he's not using so that he can then go feel whether he's using them or not. And I even mean to the point where it's pre-fatiguing because then you're going to get feedback. Like if we're trying to fix a movement, it's not, okay, we just like go do a bunch of glute ham raises and sled pushes 
and then let's throw 320 on the bar and see if you can stand it up. We're going to take a longer timeline to work on his on his squat. We're going to get him into the right positions, going to really hammer those things. And the thing that came to mind for me, because for for me personally, I always had to squat so upright because I had that butt wink that would fuck my back up. If I didn't feel like I was trying to rotate my knees and use my adductors, um, I knew that I was going to end up in the position that he was in, right? I wasn't able to bounce and throw my butt back. So it was like, am I act- actively trying to to hold that position as I go to stand up? And that was something that was super helpful for me because for the longest time, it was that unhinge and bounce and like, can I get to that point? But obviously that's not like the kind of thing that you want to do over a long enough time horizon. So for me, that hip rotation and feeling that, so much of that comes from those squat holds. You can really like actively screw your feet into the floor and feel what it's like. Like that's the thing that typically burns for me in that position if I'm doing it correctly. Yeah. Yeah. My, my guidance would be pretty similar. I think the, the activation element is something that's important. So here, here's a good indicator for anybody listening. It's like after you do, you know, your five by five back squat, if your quads are what's exclusively sore, like that's the easiest indicator that we're, we're obviously not using at least some of the musculature that we want. The activation component pre-workout is, is is like is critical and it takes a lot of reps for some it takes more than others but it takes a lot of little mini micro muscle contractions uh to really get those muscles firing so the you know the banded clamshells the glute glute bridges R- rdls uh glute ham raises back ex- hip extensions those sorts of things can get those muscles firing um and when you know you know even even something like a kettlebell swing that's a movement I really like to program for affiliates just because it gets the hip extension going. But like you need to like your ass should be on fire before you go into that squat session. And then when you do the movement, like we can't just activate the muscles and hope the movement pattern corrects itself. Things like tempo squats with a pause are super helpful in making sure that you're just holding the correct kind of positions throughout the squat. And even like if I had him in person I might set something up, create some sort of setup where like there is a tactile object, whether it's like a PVC pipe in front of his knees or whatever, and be like, hey, like you can't do not allow your knees to track any farther forward than this PVC pipe, for example. So he can still do, you know, sit his hips back, get his knees out and his knees might track forward a little bit. But, you know, what we saw in that one rep max and then across that set of five as it got he got a little bit more tired the knees are creeping further forward and that's just like yeah it's all quad so having a tactile cue in front of you where it's like don't let those knees go any further forward um so that you are engaging your posterior chain and i think a last important note is like if this is not if that's not how you squat i would you should expect to like not feel as strong even though you are using you know theoretically bigger muscles they might be bigger like square footage wise but if you don't use them obviously like you know they're they're as good as dormant so it's going to take time to learn how to recruit those muscles but it's not like you're going to rebuild your squat from from ground zero like take a handful of sessions to do it you can you can get the right feel for it and the numbers will keep going back up for sure um yeah the only note that i want to put a kind of an exclamation point on is that tempo work when we can add that level of control that the feedback is constant. We know yeah. if our knees are shooting forward, we know if we don't feel balanced and the weight should be light enough, especially while you're warming up and getting into your working sets that like you could literally adjust in real time while you're squatting. Like I'm a little bit yep. forward. I got to shift back and get into those positions. Um, next, we have to talk about whether whether he just sent this this question and we didn't get videos, but now we really have to because of the video. Like, what are you bringing to the party in terms of energy when you mm-hmm. go to do a one rep max squat? Like, if you if if you feel like you're just showing up at the gym and you're in like a nice business suit and you go over mm-hmm. and you you do your squat and it's like, okay, I tried to go down and then up and I either could do it or I couldn't do it. Check. I did my one rep max talk all the time about relative intensity 
and could it be possible to bring the level of like grinding that you do to a 5k run to a one rep max squat and everything in between right if i have this much energy but i'm doing it for one second a minute 10 minutes 20 minutes how do i spread that out or ball it all up and use it and you know i don't I don't think you have to be super rah-rah externally. Um, I, you know, sort of grew up in the, the locker room type of weightlifting and that's helpful for me. Um, you know, lifting with somebody else and someone that's at a, you know, similar level as you, you get the like hive mind of like, oh, we are, everyone here is excited and you get to work on it, but also like, could I add five pounds? Like that sort of thing. Um, and man, just that concentrated energy and power and focus that you could bring to that and you got to experiment a little and find what your version of that is i know for a fact hunter and i don't have the same version of that i've never yeah. seen hunter act like an imbecile like i do when i'm about to do a one rep max but it works for me so i continue to do it um so what is your version of that is it music is it the again the way that you brace is it like I either do believe I'm going to make this lift or I don't. Um, there's a lot of different elements. Do is should you be Todd lifting Lawrence with Davis friends? Video? Who's that? Oh, you're is that the guy bro. from the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a hundred. <laughs> um, so that is such a huge element, and it's so obvious to me because that was my world even before CrossFit. That when you see someone who didn't grow up lifting weights or didn't grow up in the team sport environment where you did something relative to a 100 max, could be a sprint, could be a skill drill, whatever it is, like it just looks different. It's like, that's not your one rep max. That's as hard as you know how to try, but that's your genetic, your yeah. potential is not being reached. It just <laughs> that's isn't. The, to me, when I, when I hear that, I think about, I think about like bike sprint day at Misfit Gym Portland. And especially when you get either beginners or members who haven't, you know, maybe they haven't been members for a very long time or even better yet, they come from a different gym. And like, it's like, I, I've had to demonstrate it like a few times before. Like you, you get someone on a bike and you can tell they do like orange theory. It's like a very, like they're gritting their teeth, they're pedaling, they're, you know, they're pedaling hard, they're pushing and pulling hard. And then it's like, move over for a second, Carl. <laughs> Rip the handles off the assault bike, please. Okay? And then all of a sudden, you see this dude <laughs> fucking moving in 360 degrees, you know, a three-dimensional plane of motion on a bike that is stationary, and it's like, holy fuck. Okay, now I see what bike sprint actually means. And then you yeah. get people fired up, and you, it's like, no, 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 yeah, no, 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 no. What you just did, that was fun. Like we're we're in Peloton class, and instructors like you can do it. Come on, here we go. And in the meantime, I'm like, motherfucker, if I swear to God, if I don't have one broken bike by the end of this class, everybody's doing this workout again. You know, it's like that. Yeah. That's the difference, and yeah. that's the heat that a lot of people. If you didn't do competitive sports, if you didn't like, if like you said, if you haven't been in that environment before, and you just don't kind of know that that is whether it's acceptable or like that's kind of the expectation or whatever. People don't know it's, it's like, possible. Exactly. Yeah. Or yeah. they just haven't, they've never seen it before. So it's like, oh, I didn't know that was like, that's the thing. And that's kind of, maybe that's where I went with like the one rep max. It's like, that looked like a moderately heavy single for the day. I kind of went in. It's like, yep, got it done. That's the number I'm going to have. And it's like, that's fine. It might be valuable from a training perspective to have a number that's like a really good, like pretty good quality squat that maybe isn't like 101% of your one rep max. But we, we gotta, we gotta understand that like, you know, what, what we're kind of talking about as far as like, what's the expectation? What is possible? What, what does it actually mean to put 100% of, you know, my one rep max and not know if I'm going to stand this thing up on the bar and, and give her a run. Yeah, if he can keep his heels down, he can squat 335. I fucking guarantee. Yeah, for sure. Like that's yeah. Um so yeah, that's that's something that is not the easiest thing in the world to teach, but you help the athlete or yourself hunt for the environment that creates that. 
because we see it all the time. I mean, like people get excited at training camp and hit a one rep max snatch or clean and jerk and it's exciting for everybody. And then they whisper to you, there's like a 30 pound PR and you're like, the fuck what <laughs> like that that's like not supposed to be a thing and yeah. that's where you find out like oh the right environment or the right coach or training partner or music or whatever um that sort of thing so i think that's an incredibly important thing to think about and then if we open it up in a more kind of broad and general thing here um this is something that i've worked on with with quite a few athletes and I think it's probably a pretty good segue from like, what can you bring, um, to your one rep max is like speed work is it's either like useless or like a warm up, <laughs> or it's incredibly powerful. Yeah. Like, like force equals mass times acceleration. The mass is your barbell. It's you, it's you standing up the weight. Um, but the acceleration is what you're bringing to the party and Man, when you see a video of a fucking meathead doing like box squats and the like just the weight like absolutely rattling and like their heels popping up off the floor as they stand up, it's like that's going to get someone fucking strong. Like that mm -hmm. just it's obvious. You can really see why. But then you have people in the CrossFit space who think speed means like down up like quickly and it's just not what it's it is. It's for time. That's yeah. what like the CrossFit driving up from the bottom of a squat or the bottom of a press or any of the movements that we're going to do this on to the top to the end of the range of motion like as fast as you possibly can and then having to because sometimes it's doubles and triples reset your brain and do it again and then you've only got a minute until you can do it again and like some people set one set two set three we start to degrade we lose focus there's a reason why we do the, the flushing that we do. People go on Instagram and forget they're fucking squatting. And like, oops, I took a nine minute rest there and now my back hurts and I can't stand up fast. Like speed work is incredibly powerful if you can actually use it properly and it can teach you how to do these things. But it also could just be triples at 60%, which doesn't do very much. Yeah, the speed work is, it's what you said is basically it's useful if you know how to use it. And if you are the type of athlete who benefits from that sort of thing, because there's also a lot of athletes who like do just due to their genetic makeup and muscle fiber type, it's very difficult to act to like recruit muscle fibers quickly enough for low percentage work to actually like to be enough to move the needle. So the, it's kind of the unfair. Speed... Faster people get way stronger with speed work. <laughs> and they're already yeah, fixed. exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Someone who's yeah, and we can we can dive into that too. But um, the speed work component is, and that that's why it's so difficult to program because so few people do it correctly. It's like ten by three at between fifty and seventy percent. It's like like you said, if you just if you do three reps at sixty percent for ten sets, but the intent isn't there, the the like the intent to contract your muscles as fast and as hard as humanly possible while also doing it correctly. It's actually like in a way more difficult than, you know, five by five at 90% because like the a successful of completion of five by five at 90% is, is the adaptation, right? So it's like, as if you did it, you probably got the adaptation, but with the speed work, there's a lot more factors and it, it, it's really more on the athlete, the, the weight and the movement isn't going to do the work for you. Like you have to bring, you know, the, the other half of the equation to the table for it to work. For sure. I extend that typically out to, and again, we're being more general now. It's not just related to the, to the, um, one rep max back squat, but I love power snatches. I love power cleans. Um, and you know, the sense where you're going fairly heavy that like, Seven, I would say 75 to 85% range somewhere in there where you can move fast and it feels like there's some weight behind it. Um, you know, uh, doing singles or drop and reset as we would call it in the two, three and four range, um, at decent weight there. Hunter already addressed the, 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 um, sprinting on machines type thing getting yourself to just get into that mode. Like, yes, we are going to manipulate tissues over time we're going to be able to change technique but like just thinking about weightlifting from the perspective of power output 
Like how hard can I truly go? Like giving yourself full rest, you know, actually waiting three minutes between your power clean sets or your power snatch sets to see if you I'm can do that. I'm ready to go now. I'm doing yep, it. Yep, ready to go now. Good. Let's just add another half-assed Metcon to the day. Like that's not what we're trying to accomplish. So there's a lot that can be done in the way of machines, sleds, power cleans, deadlifts, power snatches, where you're just asking yourself to move fast and linear progression is beautiful. You start really manageable weights and make sure that you can move them fast. And then you just add a little bit here, a little bit there over time. And you go from like, oh, I can, you know, I can do power snatch triples at 70% pretty quickly to 80 and 85%. And that will translate to the way that you pull a bar off the floor, squat, et cetera. I mean, you can't, you can't power clean or power snatch slow, right? You can, right. you can grind through a five second heavy back squat, but like <laughs> you ain't, you ain't hanging out with the bar in the hip for five seconds before you st- Pull it, pull yourself under it. It's, nope. Train, train fast if you want to be fast. I have another question here um, that's actually fairly closely related. Um, but do you have anything else to add on this topic, Hunter? Before we move on, do we want to go into like fast twitch versus slow twitch neuromuscular yeah. efficiency type deal? Sure. I mean, yeah, I think that's a that's an especially when we're talking about. Sp- crossfit specifically athletes coming from a ton of different backgrounds um it's not entirely obvious what type of athlete is going to be the is best suited for crossfit um whether it's the power the more explosive athlete because i don't know matt frazier is like one of the most explosive athletes and won the crossfit games five times um and but we've also seen athletes who are a little bit more enduring endurance based still perform at an extremely high level. So, um, if I might push back on that a little bit, I think the combination is so impressive, but Jeff had to turn himself from the power guy to the endurance guy. Justin's for, for his body weight is fucking stupidly strong. Um, so, but you're, I'm talking about just the one guy there. We see yeah. guys the outside of that realm on the podium that get close to it, but like, like someone said in one of the interviews with Castro, like the the guy, the strongest guy at the games who can run wins, <laughs> and like, you know, that kind of makes sense. But like, sure. it's it's interesting to think about. Yeah, no, I think, and I think just being able to identify what type of athlete you are can help. Like, you know, for someone like this, let's assume that Ryan, it's Ryan, right? It yep. doesn't have doesn't have a remote coach and you know he is somebody who's because his one rep and five rep max are pretty close together that indicates to me that he is either you know and again and let's assume his one rep max is in fact his one rep max and that it, like that's the heaviest he can do that indicates to me that like his percentages might be a little bit higher for something like a five rep max because he needs a heavier weight to yield the same adaptation what you were saying about speed work is the athlete who the athlete who is super explosive and super powerful doesn't need as heavy of loading because they not they're going to move that weight faster they're going to recruit muscle fibers more quickly and they're going to fatigue faster so they don't need the volume um they don't need the same volume as somebody who um who's you know maxes are close together like that so somebody like Ryan could benefit from, you know, if it's a heavy squat day, maybe the percentages are a little bit higher because that's what's required for him to make the adaptation. But, um, it, yeah, I don't, I don't want to get like so far down the weeds of like how sure. to find whether, what type of athlete you are, but just understanding that, you know, you know, <laughs> a more explosive athlete doesn't need as many repetitions because they're neuromuscularly efficient. They can recruit more muscle fibers more quickly and they're more powerful versus somebody maybe like Ryan who doesn't recruit as much muscle tissue as quickly, but is more enduring. And that's, you know, one is not better than the other. There's just, it it helps to know where you kind of fall on that spectrum for your own training. My final thoughts on this one is just related to potentially being a lot of athletes are a bit of a head case about the back squat. Um, it just Hard. happens sometimes, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a very challenging movement and it's, 
so present in the, I don't know, the fucking zeitgeist of CrossFit, but it's not that present in CrossFit. So it's, it's really interesting. We use it a ton. It's referenced a lot. People talk about the 500 back squat and five minute mile, all that stuff. So one of the things that I'll do is like, okay, you can squat five for a lot. Let's squat 10 for a lot and then eight for a lot and then six for a lot and then four and then two. Mm. And like, I usually over the course of that, that 20 week template that I send out to people, um, can get someone to do a double at their one rep max. And then it's like, they're not a head case about their clean and their snatch, which is what matters way more. And then voila, I don't fucking care about your one rep max back squat until you're fighting for top 20 at the CrossFit games and they do total for the fifth time. Like, yeah. I don't really care. What I care about is your ability to, to move weight. So let's just get you stronger. So I've had a lot of athletes who have a great two rep, three rep, four rep, five rep. And it's like, okay, we're going to do the same thing that we do with everybody else. We're going to go high rep then we're going to go fives and we're just going to get you stronger and you're going to be able to use that in other places. Some people just get so obsessed with that number. They always do the dumbest shit when they're like, if someone who wants to back squat 405 so bad, 375 feels good while they're warming up. So the fucking 15s come out and get slapped on the outside and they fail it after a half ass attempt because they don't believe they can hit it. And then they're like, I can't squat 405. And it's like, yeah, I mean, the, that was the, a great jump. <laughs> yeah. One, one thing we didn't really address is the, is just that it's like, how do you prepare and then build up for a one rep max? Like, what does that look like? Did you, yep. did you do 135 and then 155 and then 185 and then 205 and 225 and 245? And did you do 7,000 reps before you got there or or did you go in the opposite direction? Did you go 135, 225, 315, 405? Nope. Okay, I'm done. Like, yeah, exactly. So that's the Austin Spencer strict press plan. 135 I mean, to and be a fair, weight that he doesn't think he my, can hit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I might go load up my one rep max out there right now and just see if I can press it cold because there's it's the same probability as if I do a 20 minute warm up and go to press. But I love that. All right. Um, God damn fucking strict press. Love it. I got a I got a new project I'm working on that I. Were you doing uh, strict presses? I saw the tripod oh, out there the other day oh, and oh, some yeah. fucking corn on the. Once, like, once Ted tells me what app I need to edit reels, you'll you guys will be seeing some. I'm doing a I'm doing a little little content. Um, all right. All right. Next question, related, but also not. From him. No, different yeah. athlete. I had a question that I thought I'd ask before. I just did it unilaterally. By far, my worst conditioning pieces are short slash gas, especially if a barbell <laughs> is involved. <laughs> Give me a medium to long domain any day. If there isn't an obvious piece to hit that short time domain during the week, so he's talking about looking at the programming on Fitter, being able to see the full week, and he doesn't see an obvious choice to get him better at that, I was going to start adapting a piece into one. Like next week, I plan on making Friday's ski clean a seven-minute AMRAP. That way, that was a long way for me to see a long way for me to see what you thought about something like that. To be clear, this is a fifteen-round workout that has like fifteen yeah, wrong. calories. Don't do that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I covered that with him. What, this is uh... in, this this is this is interesting right here. So. This screams strategy to me right off the bat. I'm just not buying okay. that someone is really good at these other pieces and terrible at the short ones. Now, could he be talking about like Isabel or Fran or something like that? Okay. But if he's talking about like, I'm amazing at six minute Mac or I'm terrible at six minute Mac cons and amazing at 10 minute Metcons. I want to know like when he sees short and gas, does he think let's stomp the gas pedal and then fizzle out? I think strategy would be a huge component to what's going on here. And think said, back, especially if there's a barbell involved. Yeah. Think. And, and so he could be biting off more than he can chew big sets. Um, Sherb has struggled with this in the past. We'll have like, like games athletes in town and he works out with them and it's a five round workout that's whatever seven to eight minutes long and 
you bet your ass it's unbro hard on the machine unbroken push jerks and then he's in first place and ends up in last so like you feel good at the beginning of those metcons we're not asking you to tackle a ton maybe in your first round or something like that um and then you get fucking buried and these people who are good at longer metcons that can strategize these properly i think can make up a lot of ground so for me i would probably go there first like mm. do you think that your strategy is sound like are we seeing rounds that are like you know, comparable to one another. Like I'm strategizing this really well. I'm still getting bad scores. Cause I think that would be a totally different thing. Yeah. From there doing short Metcons is not the first place you go to get better at short Metcons doing a lot of interval work where you can go harder and learn how to strategize and recover and repeat and doing the same thing on machines makes a lot more sense to me. Because then we can check off the boxes of strategies obvious. If I give you, if I'm a remote coach, I'm going to be super simple about it. I'm going to give you five rounds of a couplet. Every round is going to be exactly the same. I'm going to give you more rest than I would give somebody else. Was that the right pace? Was that the right sets and reps? What do you do in the next round? What do you do in the next round? That kind of thing. Um, yeah. It checks so many boxes off to be able to do that. So it's not always as obvious as the thing that I'm not good at is the thing that I need to do to get better at it. Yeah, I think um, my, where my mind went first as you were asking the question is that there is a weekly piece that says power something, power assault bike, power row, power ski, mm -hmm. power whatever. Um, it, is it, it, ultimately I think the question com just comes down to is it a energy system thing meaning that you're just not a powerful athlete uh and therefore like those short workouts just bury you or or is it a strategy thing so is it a is it just a physiological adaptation thing or is there a, a strategy thing maybe a little bit of both but um the 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 strategy the the, the strategy to get better is not reduce the time of a metcon to the time domain I mean, you like you could do that. I wouldn't like recommend just bastardizing a random Metcon because we wrote them in a way that they're meant to be the duration that they're that they're written at. But what what that means is like so. Let let's imagine that you do take that piece and you do you know shave half the rounds off of it. That changes the approach to it completely, right? And then it goes back to is it a strategy thing? Like, do you now right. know that this five round workout is now you know, five minutes of go as hard as you can versus 15 minutes of a merry-go-round. And there's the strategy right. component. But um, for me, I'm like, I'm looking at July 26th, power row, one minute by three row calories. <laughs> and I'm like, me personally, like I'm sick that day. Like I like- In one way whoever, or another. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Whoever asked that question, that's you know, you're, you're describing me. I don't, I don't want to go super, super fucking hard for two to four minutes because it's, it's fucking miserable. Like I get it. Um, that leads me to the question of like, are you scared? Are you just, you could try, you could try harder. Have you tried are, trying? Are you really, are you bad at you it? Have you tried Austin? trying? <laughs> I have asked that question before to variable <laughs> to various different types of athletes but um but then again that to me it's like let's assume that you're not just half-assing it. it it goes back to the strategy question so um, yeah yeah just how to approach this those is a sprinting long, type workouts this is a long time misfit athletics follower and i know that our medium metcons and longer metcons have light barbells medium weight barbells heavy barbells, all different movements. If you are doing well in those workouts, like that's, mm. that's kind of the most impressive version of express, especially the like black hole. Well, so, that's like, where I'm like, is it really a strategy thing where it's like you can seemingly strategize medium and long durations really well, but not short workouts super well. And I just, is it people with that level of aerobic functioning, can clear waste and can, if they strategize well in the shorter ones, do well. 
like maybe not first place, but yeah. like if he's just feels like I'm keeping up with everybody on medium and long and can't do short, there's I feel like there's something odd about what's going on within those. Whether mm-hmm. it's, you know, it could be technique, it could be strategy. Um, but yeah, I just I know that with what we do for variance and how we put certain things into certain workouts that this shouldn't be the case. If it was the opposite, it'd be obvious. You well, no yeah, fucking then, aerobic functioning. You run 90 minute miles, like that kind of thing. And then this goes back to the, like the drop in who's never done bike sprint day at misfit gym, Portland. And is like, no, 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 no. This is how bike sprint day goes. And you try to rip the handles off the bike. And it's like, Oh, I get it now. And then it's translating that sort of effort, that sort of expectation to the four minute Metcon. The 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 tough part it too is that like once you surpass like three minutes, like we need strategy, right? It's like Fran, two minute, two minute workout. There's no strategy for the people that we're talking to. It's like you're gonna do this unbroken, you're gonna do this as fast as fucking humanly possible. And as you get fitter, there gets to a point where it's like you need to actively pull the barbell back onto your shoulders. Like it's un- doing it unbroken is no longer enough to separate yourself. Like the- there are additional steps that are required. But beyond that, we do have there is a strategy element that comes into play, even if it's like the strategy is I need you to go at 98 percent effort, you know, compared to 103 percent effort. Um and it takes practice. And if you have the fitness in those medium and long duration workouts, then maybe it is a practice thing. It is learning how to actually go go into that dark place and and see how long you can hang out there. Yeah, man, like a five, six minute Metcon that you're staying moving the whole time. You end up in a heap of yourself on the floor after something yeah. like that. Those are bad. One, one like sort of, I guess I'll put this down as my final thoughts for this topic is I know of like three or four top 15 men and women in the world that miss out on five places, I'd say, at the games because they don't want to go there on stuff like this. And I think when you get to a certain level, like this, like when I do these kind of workouts, it's weird because I can make a round or two hurt really bad, like really bad. But then it's not as bad as someone who has the aerobic functioning. Like one of the reasons you probably hate it is because at a lot of those workouts, your scores round and round are similar. And that sucks. <laughs> yeah. You have to continue well, to step back up to the plate. And some of these athletes can go do that one minute of calories and get within a few calories of each other each time. And that's like a fucking out of body experience, right? Like, yeah. I'm just like, well, my muscles aren't like cooperating. Round one sucked really bad, but I'm so there are people who just have that ability to repeat really shitty things and back way off of it because they're like, this is going to ruin my day. Like this is going to be really fucking bad and I don't want to go there. So it's, it's a problem top to bottom. Yeah. Yeah. I think my, my final thoughts on the topic are just like the, it, we did talk, we talked, we, I don't want to give the athlete an excuse that it's like, it's your strategy because I do think that like, and if he's a longtime follower, maybe this doesn't apply to them quite as much, but the, the intensity aspect of CrossFit is like, I fear is slowly getting lost, uh, especially when people tap into like competitor programs where it's like, I got a whole menu of things that I'm expected to do. So to go and do one minute by three on the rower, but also have a 15 rounder and some snatch work or, and, or a five by five. It's like, it's so fucking easy to do that at 5%, you know, five fewer percentage points of effort than was actually needed to get the adaptation that we were after. And it's, it's, just it's such a pervasive thing like one minute by three that one i'm staring at that piece right now it's highlighted in green one minute by three with five to seven minutes of rest in between like i i would need way fucking longer to like roll around on the floor and recover from that than it will be to do that workout and that will be the only thing that i would do that day granted i'm not a competitive crossfitter but it's like 
You see that sort of piece? You have to understand well, what you're what's saying being is the baseline view. So like you would need to be able to do that exactly yep. how you explained it and yep. then those other things afterwards. Exactly. Right? Which is for me like it's not going to happen. And right, for sure. most of the fo- most of our followers like it like maybe it is, maybe it isn't and it needs to but but it needs to, <laughs> right? I guess like sure. if, yeah. if if that's where we need to make the improvement, that's where the energy has to go and you know, if you kind of orange theory your way through one minute by three it's like yeah. that's that's zero adaptation that's that's yeah, a one up. thing that i'm excited about for this year for phase one phase two phase three which takes us 27 weeks from september all the way up into january february is um the open athlete instructions this year there's no there's no choices it's this is your lift mm. and this is your conditioning piece every single day and I would guess 30 to 40% of the people following Misfit Athletics would do best on that program. And mm. maybe they're adding something on Saturday and Sunday. I'm going to do a double session. I'm going to go back later and work on this skill or I'm going to do whatever. But just thinking about the, the level of adaptation that takes place out on the floor oftentimes rivals someone adding that third piece in hatchet so it's like yep. we are asking for something different out there um and I, I think they can make some some pretty crazy adaptations so we haven't done an episode like that in a while um it's definitely the kind of thing that's fun for us as coaches um gets our gets our brains working so um if you guys like that content and would like to to listen slash see more of it um, obviously discord is a really good place to, to do that. You guys can, if you want it to be done anonymously, you can, you know, shoot me a DM. If you want to go into the questions channel on discord, go ahead and do that. Um, but I think this is the kind of thing that would be fun to do every once in a while. So if you guys have questions about a particular movement or energy system, or I want to get better at X, Y, and Z, um, definitely throw that into discord or DM me on Instagram, whatever it is, let us know what you'd like to see. And if you enjoy the episode. Anything else? No. I burned my final thoughts on the final thoughts. Noise. All right. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Thank you to our show sponsor, sharpentheaxco.com. Use your favorite athlete code, properfuel.co. Use the code word misfit, misfitathletics.com. Make sure you get signed up before August 5th. That is when phase zero starts. That is when we do our baseline testing for the entire off season and affiliate phase one team misfit.com or the sugar wad marketplace gets signed up before Monday, August 19th podcasts for both phases incoming. See you guys next week. Later. Bye.